My name is Robert Christman, and I'm a professor of history at Luther College in Decorah, Iowa. My area of expertise is pre-modern European history, and one of the topics that I focus on is the Black Death and how it changed European culture and society. And in fact, I regularly teach courses on this subject. Like everyone else today, I'm caught up in the coronavirus outbreak. And as I observe how people are reacting, I can't help but notice many similarities uh, to how our European ancestors uh, responded during the pandemic of the Black Death. So I would like to spend a few minutes addressing some of these similarities and asking the question, what can we learn from our predecessors? The title of my presentation is, History Never Repeats Itself, But It Rhymes, Responses to the Black Death and the Coronavirus. History Never Repeats Itself, But It Rhymes is a quotation that is attributed to the great American author Mark Twain. What do you think he meant by it? Well, it seems to me that he was saying that while the present is never precisely the same as the past, as what went before, if we look closely at it, we will hear echoes of the past. Uh, put more concretely, despite very significant differences in culture, in society, and in general worldview between the late Middle Ages and uh, the contemporary world, uh, human beings, nonetheless, react similarly to similar sets of circumstances. And I think this should be both a source of comfort to us, but also perhaps a warning for us. So here is my plan. I would like to uh, first uh, introduce the Black Death and describe how the disease worked in comparison to coronavirus. Then I will look at a number of responses to the, to the two pandemics, highlighting how human beings respond in similar ways to similar circumstances. And finally, I would like to uh, conclude by suggesting some lessons that we might learn from this comparison. So let's get started. What was the Black Death? Uh, the Black Death was one of three major outbreaks of bubonic plague that have been recorded in history. So it seems as though scientists tell us that the plague, the bubonic plague, uh, returns on what are called big cycles. There have been three outbreaks. The first outbreak was is, is, re, is called the Plague of Justinian after the Byzantine Emperor in whose reign uh, it, it first started. Uh, and so it started in 541. The first major outbreak was 541 and 542, uh, but it returned on a recurrent basis all the way up until about 750. Uh, the second major outbreak is uh, the outbreak from which we get the term the Black Death and that began in Southern Europe in 1347. And in uh, a four year period, it moved from the south to the north, all the way to Scandinavia and ultimately to Iceland, uh, killing uh, between a quarter and a half of the population of Europe. It then recurred just like the plague of Justinian again and again on a 10 to 12 year basis. Uh, throughout the period of 1347 to 1720, when the last major outbreak occurred in Marseille, France. The third of these big cycles was an eruption of plague that began in China, central China, in 1898, and it spread to the uh, west, into India, and to the east all the way to the Chinese coast, where it was transplanted into ports as far away as Glasgow, Scotland, and San Francisco, California. Uh, the plague was ultimately uh, eradicated in uh, 1952 in, in, uh, in China. And it's from this, made, this big cycle, this major outbreak, that we get our understanding of how bubonic plague works in the, in the body. Before I get to that point, however, I'd like to just mention that the plague bacilli, or bacteria, it's a bacterial disease, uh, still exist in the rodent populations in different places in the world, for example, in Africa, 
in Asia and in the western US. So if you go to the four corner region of the western United States, you'll see signs like the one here regarding plague. So let's uh, take a minute and compare these two diseases, how they spread, how they attack the body, and other key characteristics. If we start with the bubonic plague, uh, as I just mentioned, it's bacterial. Uh, the bacteria is formally, formally known as Yersinia pestis. And of course, as a bacterial infection, if it's caught in time, if it's caught quickly, uh, anti antibiotics can eradicate it. But of course, they weren't discovered until uh, 1929, and they weren't widely put into use until the 1940s. Now, bubonic plague is transmitted in two different ways. Um, the first and most common was probably via rats, uh, in which the plague bacteria resided. So plague is, in fact, a disease of rats. It's only secondarily a human disease. So when it breaks out among rats, the fleas that are naturally inhabit these creatures bite them. Um, they suck some of their blood, ingesting the bacteria as well. And when the rat dies, the flea looks for a new host, um, preferably another rat, but in a pinch, a human being will also do. When it then bites the human being, it transfers the plague bacteria to that person and thereby infects them. A second way in which uh, plague could be spread was person to person, and that is via sputum, which is the technical word for the droplets that come out of our nose or mouth when we cough, sneeze, or otherwise uh, expire matter. And these droplets were then breathed in directly to the lungs and thereby spreading the bacteria. Now, uh, the plague can take three different forms in the body. In its bubonic form, uh, bacteria is injected by the fleas into the lymphatic system. Uh, it then lodges in the small capillaries of, that abound in the lymph nodes, uh, the one nearest to the flea bite, so under the arms, the armpits, uh, in the groin area, or on the back of the neck, as we see with this picture of a young woman from the Philippines. Once it's in the lymph nodes, it rapidly reproduces, causing them to swell and eventually to burst. The bacteria then in, invades the bloodstream and the, it attacks the internal organs, causing severe damage and oftentimes death. A second form uh, that, uh, of the disease is the septicemic form in which the bacteria is injected into the blood. Um, there it multiplies as well, causing sepsis and ultimately attacking the internal organs as well. And the third form is the pneumonic form, which I mentioned already. It's the respiratory form in which the bacteria is received directly into the lungs via droplets in the air. Now, in its bubonic form, the incubation period was two to eight days. In a mild case, uh, one's fever would spike to 105 degrees. The victim would have headaches, uh, generalized pain, uh, but all of this would pass in one to three weeks. Chances of dying from the disease if you caught the bubonic form were 60%. Uh, so it wasn't a death sentence, but it was a very high death rate. If the disease was acquired in its septicemic form or, or even more importantly in its pneumonic form, the death rate was essentially 100%. And in the pneumonic form, uh, death would occur very quickly in one to three days. A couple more issues with regard to plague. Um, generally, there was a seasonality to it. It was a summer disease. Uh, it would uh, occur depending upon where you were in Europe, um, beginning in late uh, in June sometime or July, and lasting until August, September, or October. In its initial outbreak in 1347 to 1351, as I mentioned, uh, historians believe that it killed between 25% and 50% of the population of Europe. Now, if we move on to COVID-19, a few uh, similarities and also differences. One difference is that it is a viral disease, not bacterial, and therefore antibiotics don't work on it. It has an incubation period of one to 14 days, although most people develop symptoms in five or six days. 
Uh, like the pneumonic form of the plague, it's spread mainly by inhaling droplets that have been expelled by someone with the disease. Uh, it can spread also uh, by touching a door handle or a countertop that has the virus on it and then rubbing one's eyes or face. Uh, by comparison to medieval plague, uh, mortality rates for COVID-19 are, are rather small and dependent largely on age, on sex, on general health. Uh, overall, they're pro probably under 3% of those who get the, the disease as compared with 60% of those who got medieval plague. However, uh, COVID-19 spreads very easily person to person and very quickly. And we see that here in these two maps. On the right-hand side, um, we see uh, the COVID-19 and its spread over a three-month period. And essentially, within those three months, uh, the entire uh, world has been infected, or at least uh, it's been seeded throughout the world. Um, obviously, uh, uh, great strides in transportation have made this possible. Um, but if we look uh, to the left at the map of Europe, we see the spread of bubonic plague in one year increments. So it be began in the very south of France and, and, and northern Italy there in the area near Genoa. And in 1347, at the very end of the year, it hit there. And what you see there, the different colors are one year increments. So it moved north. Uh, up through uh, Scandinavia, all the way up to Iceland, as I mentioned. Um, so with regard to bubonic plague, it moved quite slowly. Uh, historians think perhaps uh, one uh, or uh, half a mile per day or so, and uh, that was both a blessing and a curse. So let's move on to some responses uh, to these two uh, pandemic diseases. History rhymes. Here are some social responses to the diseases. Uh, the over, overwhelming human reaction to both of these pandemics was fear. A recent New York Times article uh, quotes a woman from California as saying the following. I am normally a very positive person, outgoing, happy, energetic, definitely a glass half full. However, lately I cannot get through a day without tears, often sobs. I'm terrified for myself and my family and everyone in the world. All the things I love, I'm now afraid to do. Of course, she is not alone. We hear this sentiment over and over again today. And as you might expect, like the coronavirus, people feared the plague and they were terrified of it. Uh, because it moved slowly, this anxiety had time to build. For example, months before the plague jumped the English Channel, the entire British Isles uh, prayed fervently in the churches to be spared this disease, but of course the water didn't stop it. And cities such as Florence, Italy or London, England would paint a, a red cross on the door of an infected house. And of course, such an occurrence in a neighborhood would set the whole neighborhood into high anxiety. It was also tradition that each time someone died, the church bells were rung. And it got to the point where the ringing of the church bells occurred all day long. Sort of what I hear uh, is happening in New York City with regard to the ambulance sirens right now. They just don't quit. And these external signs exacerbated the, the levels of angst and anxiety. In the medieval period, there were other uh, fears as in addition to the death of oneself and one's loved ones, there was the fear of abandonment. So it was not uncommon that when the plague hit a family, some of the members who were, uh, who were well would flee the sick person. So there was this fear of desertion. Uh, there was also a fear of chaos uh, in cities where uh, civic functions began to break down one sees essentially anarchy occurring. So the famous 14th century author Giovanni Boccaccio uh, described Florence, Italy in the time of plague as follows. He writes, in the face of such affliction and misery, all respect for the laws of God and man had virtually broken down and had extinguished in our city. For like everybody else, those ministers and executors of the laws who were not either dead or ill, 
were left with so few subordinates that they were unable to discharge any of their duties. Hence, everyone was free to behave as he pleased. So in addition to the other fears, watching the breakdown of society caused anxiety on top of everything else. As with the coronavirus, there was social distancing in the time of the plague. And we're just now learning how burdensome social distancing can be, both the physical and the mental toll it can take. In the 14th century, social distancing, distancing was mostly the result of the fear of catching the plague, but sometimes it was enjoined by the authorities as well. Again, uh, the author Boccaccio tells us, one citizen avoided another. Everybody neglected their neighbors and rarely or never visited their parents and relatives unless from a distance. The ordeal had so withered the hearts of men and women that brother abandoned brother and uncle abandoned nephew and sister her brother and many times wives abandoned their husbands. And what is even more incredible and cruel, mothers and fathers abandoned their children and would refuse to visit them. So we see in the medieval period these tightest bonds of society, these familial connections beginning to fray, giving way to social distancing. Quarantine and the isolation of the sick were also widespread in times of plague in Europe. In fact, the English word quarantine comes from the Italian word quaranta, which means 40. And that's a reference to the 40 days that people and goods were expected to separate themselves from society when they came from a plague-infested area into a, a, an area without plague. In fact, many of the public health practices that have been deployed in the coronavirus outbreak were pioneered by the Italian city-states in the 14th and 15th centuries as the plague recurred again and again. Very quickly, these city-states set up information gathering networks um, to know precisely where plague was present, where the hotspots were. The sick were isolated from the healthy in hospitals that were built on the outskirts of town. Uh, you can see here from this picture of a plague hospital in Milan that it was on the outskirts of town and surrounded by a very high wall. The Italians also pioneered the concept of quarantining sick family members, or the, the family members of a sick individual. So not just uh, was the sick person isolated, but the family members were quarantined as well. They banned large gatherings to contain the spread. And finally, we start to see governments working together, lots of interterritorial cooperation. It became quickly clear to them uh, that uh, no city-state could battle this this enemy on their own. Cooperation was necessary. And all of this uh, expansion of state power also led to some severe reactions. So I'd like to turn to those. With all this new power came a distrust of the authorities and accusations uh, that the government was overreaching its legitimate powers, something that we're beginning to see, I think, with regard to the coronavirus. It's kind of a silly example, but I just read the other day that in response to the governor of Michigan's new order prohibiting people from going to their vacation homes in the northern part of the state, one person wrote, and I quote, yeah, I get the purpose, but it's a gross overreach of government. You can travel back uh, to Michigan and from Michigan and out of state, but I can't travel two hours up north to sit in my cabin alone. So you hear the critique of government overreach. Uh, the same was true in times of plague, and perhaps the most obvious example of this is a phenomena that comes from the third major outbreak of plague, the one that occurred in China in the 19th and early 20th centuries. There it was uh, British colonial rulers who were taking a Western style approach to medicine and who started to institute laws against congregating in groups uh, against traveling from city to city. And at the same time, they began enforcing quarantines and the isolation of the sick, all of these Western medical practices. And the uh, response from the Chinese was uh, swift and negative. 
they were still functioning on notions of traditional medicine that contradicted these ideas. So as a result, they saw the actions of the British government as a power grab in an effort to increase uh, their, uh, the, their authority. So tensions broke out and there was rioting. And it would not surprise me at all if in the coming weeks and months we start to see more and more dissatisfaction with what some people will uh, refer to and understand as government overreach. Further tensions uh, increased uh, during the time of the plague between the wealthy and the poor. There was this sense that the wealthy had the means to insulate themselves from the disease and they did so by leaving the cities and the poor to fend for themselves. In the 14th century, this meant that they fled uh, to their country homes. In fact, the whole premise of Giovanni Boccaccio's plague-inspired masterwork called the Decameron, the whole uh, sort of premise was that 10 young noble women and noble men fled to the country, uh, to one of their country homes to avoid the plague, fled Florence, Italy. So there they were bored with nothing to do, no Netflix, no TikTok. So they decided to tell stories. Each day for 10 days, each of them told a story totaling 100 stories, which is the meaning of the title of the work, the Decameron and represents the content of the work. Boccaccio's own evaluation of such people can be heard from his description of them. This is what he writes. Caring for no one but themselves, Huge numbers of men and women abandon their rightful city, their rightful homes, their relatives and their parents and their things and sought out the countryside. So clearly Boccaccio saw such actions as self-centered and heartless. And today we're seeing similar sentiments. Um, the flight of the wealthy to vacation homes has caused a lot of negative feelings a silly example again, but one that comes to mind is Justin Timberlake and his wife, Jessica Beale, who have been skewered in the press uh, for leaving LA and going to their second home in Montana to wait out COVID-19. There, uh, Timberlake uh, is uh, said to have articulated the following sentence, 24 hour parenting is just not human. The response to this uh, sentiment has been swift and brutal. To give one example, someone wrote in the following. I'm parenting a toddler by myself, trying to simultaneously do that and work from home and somehow expected to hold it together while my income was cut 75%. I sincerely want them both punched in the face immediately. So as with tensions over increased government oversight, I suspect that we will start to see more and more criticism and ill will toward the wealthy in the coming weeks and months. Another dynamic that we see both in the past and in the present is this huge tension between economic interests and medical welfare or health considerations. So just as today cities and territories, uh, just as today cities and territories of the past knew that responses to the plague would have massive detrimental effects on the economy. We see this uh, most prevalent, prevalently in the slow response of political authorities to declare publicly the presence of plague when it broke out. Perhaps uh, the situation in San Francisco in 1906 is the best example of this. There, the Board of Trade, the Chamber of Commerce, and the powerful railroads teamed up with the politicians to suppress the news. Later, after uh, the outbreak had been uh, ad uh, addressed, there was a commission set up to look at the actions of the mayor and the report acknowledged that the mayor, and this is a quote from that report, refused to approve the printing of health reports and vital statistics and attempted to remove from office four members of the Board of Health who persisted in the statement that the plague existed in the city. So that is a stinging indictment of the mayor's actions. In actual fact, it was not until the newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst got wind of the rumor that there was plague in San Francisco uh, 
And when he heard this, he started publishing the most lurid accounts from the plague of London in 1666, but attributing them to San Francisco. It's not until he did that that the government finally had to admit that the, the plague was present in San Francisco. So economic concerns, not to mention unethical press practices, have been part and parcel of human responses to epidemic disease all along. But I think the most disturbing human response to the Black Death was to look for scapegoats. And the scapegoats that were uh, 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 targeted were those who were already on the periphery of society, those against whom prejudices already existed. So the poor and vagrants were seen as carriers of plague and they were ostracized or even sometimes attacked and murders, murdered. Even more reprehensible was the treatment of the Jews, who were a group in society always considered second-class citizens in, in the medieval world. In many parts of Europe, conspiracy theorists claim that the plague was actually a plot by these Jews meant to destroy Christianity, and they were accused of poisoning the wells, uh, and that was supposed to be the source of the disease. As a result, there were massive outbreaks of violence against the Jews that ripped, rippled through Europe. Here's a quotation from one of the many, many medieval commentators who described the violence against the Jews. He writes, On Saturday, that was St. Valentine's Day, they burnt the Jews on a wooden platform in their cemetery. There were about 2,000 of them. Those who wanted to baptize themselves were spared. Many small children were taken out of the fire and baptized against the will of their fathers and mothers. Thus were the Jews burnt at Strasbourg and in the same year in all the cities of the Rhine. These types of scenes, unfortunately, would be repeated again and again in subsequent outbreaks of the plague. And in the outbreak of the plague in San Francisco, in the early 20th century, it was the Chinese Americans who were targets of anger and prejudice. The operative notion was that the plague was their fault and they were somehow the ones who were spreading it. Although we have not yet witnessed anything nearly so extreme uh, as some of these events with regard to the coronavirus, we have seen signs of prejudice and scapegoating already appearing. A recent New York Times article had the following title, spit on, yelled at, attacked. Chinese Americans fear for their safety. And I fear that as it spreads, not only will Chinese Americans, but also perhaps others of the most vulnerable us, of, among us will become targeted. I think here particularly of the homeless. Will they become seen as carriers and spreaders of the coronavirus? Some concluding thoughts. The 14th century uh, seems like a vastly different world. And indeed, there are many uh, differences between then and now. Uh, I haven't emphasized them, but uh, we might uh, I'll just uh, focus on a couple of them quickly here. There was a massive focus on religion. And the notion was that the plague had been sent by God as punishment for sin. And that was a sort of ubiquitous view. We don't see that so much uh, during the coronavirus. Um, the recommendations of the medical authorities are, from our perspective, odd and even disgusting. So here's a quote from a medical doctor of the period. He says that, I quote, he took a large toad, held it by its legs near the fire, allowed it to vomit up insects and flies of a greenish color, let it dry among, along with the vomit, ground that up and administered it to his patients. That was his approach. So the past is indeed a foreign land. But one of the questions that I ask my students when we study the Black Death is whether the responses to the plague they encounter are 14th century responses like the ones I just suggested or human responses. And it's interesting because at the beginning of the course, they often say that the responses are specific to the 14th century. But by the end of the course, they come to the conclusion that most are human responses to disaster and times of great stress, regardless of the period of history. 
History does, it seem, indeed rhyme. That realization, I would argue, can do three, three things for us. First, it can, can connect us to the past. So a knowledge that we are not the first to fight this fight, that others have as well, establishes a bond between us and all humanity. Second, this knowledge should offer us a warning. Will we fall into the same traps as our ancestors? Will we allow the coronavirus to accentuate the tensions in our society, to pit the people against the government, the poor against the wealthy, and I think most importantly, will we allow scapegoating to occur? And finally, I believe that this knowledge should give us hope. Others have fought this fight, suffered deeply, but come through and come out the other side. We too will prevail. Thank you.